69. We are only 69 Patreon supporters away from hitting our first goal. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. For less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you can help support the show. We are only 69 Patreon subscribers away from hitting our goal, which will allow this channel to continue to grow and prosper so we can bring you the best content possible. For more information, check the link down below and join us on Patreon. I would really appreciate your support. Thank you. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. One good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. Uh, and I'm telling you what's so... F I don't know if I like this or hate this, but every body of water, it just gets rushed. I remember late late spring, early summer, you had like five big tournaments back to back to back weekends at the Potomac. And then we basically hit the gauntlet again. We had the BFL Super Tournament. We had the Toyota Series. And I believe as of recording this, I think the All-American is this weekend too on the Potomac. It's absolutely insane how this place gets just crushed. And so one person that I've been really wanting to get on is the guy that won the BFL Super Tournament on the Potomac. Zach, thank you so much for coming on. Yep, thanks. Thanks for having me, man. So, as always, let's start from the beginning here. Like, what really got you into this, and how did you get to this moment? Um, I mean, I've been fishing with my dad since a really young age. You know, I mean, I remember back when I was a kid, it was you know every Saturday it was you know load up the boat and let's go, and we were always you know either going to Bugs Island, we went to Bugs Island a lot, and Potomac River was a big place that we went all the time. So, I mean, I've, I've been fishing with my dad since I was a kid, so. Have you been in the area this whole time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, from Prince George. Oh, okay, cool. So, yeah, you're local then. Yeah. When, yeah. when did you make the big jump going from, you know, the back of the boat to the front of the boat? Or have you always just been in the front of the boat? No, so, I mean, uh, Let's see, it was probably, so I'm, I'm 26, and uh, I, I, I bought my first boat um, probably a year or two after I graduated um, high school, but uh, I've, I've always been fishing tournaments with my dad. I mean, when we were, when I was uh, younger, we fished the Fishers of Men um, team tournament trail when I was a kid um, that uh, Steve Camp ran back in the day, and um, we fished as an adult junior team. And, uh, but, uh, you know, and then growing up, just, uh, I played ball, you know, baseball in there in, uh, high school and, uh, middle school and all that. So kind of fishing kind of took a little bit of a backseat, you know, mm -hmm. to that, you know, when I was starting to get into high school and everything, cause I was playing year round. But so about the time I graduated high school, um, you know, I got a good job and I bought my first boat and, uh, I mostly did a lot of fun fishing for the most part. I didn't really jump into the tournament scene and, you know, on my own, I say on my own, but I fished as a co-angler, um, a couple of years, um, just kind of get my teeth wet while I was still starting to run my own boat and fish by myself a lot, you know, fun fishing. And then, um, I want to say 20, I want to say 2022 was the first year I fished in BFL as a boater. Um, wow. so yeah. What, and this is something that's going to have to be brought up, but what clicked? Because if you look at, at, at kind of your stats here, guys, and 2023 was a damn good year for you. Uh, ninth place at Kerr, third place on the Potomac, uh, eighth place on the James, and then, you know, the big win here at the Super Tournament. I mean, it's one thing when, when you see a guy that has a couple of wins or a couple of good finishes and it's sprinkled out through your career, but you decided, nah, hell with it. I'm just going to get it all banged out this year. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, it's been a unbelievable year um you know i mean i had a, had a great teacher and my dad you know spending a lot of time in the boat with my dad i mean he's taught me a ton over the years um but i mean we so we uh started fishing um the elite 70s um the virginia elite 70s under steve camp um i want to say it was 2021 um we got into those um because we wanted to start fishing fishing a team series again together um and I just, to be honest, I just didn't have the vacation time with work to be able to do them both, you know. So it was kind of, I wanted to start getting into the BFLs because I had my own boat and everything. But then we got into that lottery to go back and fish with them under the Elite 70. So I was kind of like, all right, well, 
either use my vacation time for that or I can use my vacation time for BFL. So of course I use my vacation time for that, but, um, you know, and I would just dabble in a couple of BFLs here and there. Um, mainly if they lined up with the elite seventies, we'd go down and fish a BFL. We've got a great group of guys that we stay with. So it's always fun. But so now this year was kind of the first year that I was going to, um, have enough vacation time to, to do both, you know, fish the elite seventies and the BFLs. And, um, I'm going to be honest, I wasn't even planning on fishing any BFLs this year because me and my wife decided to uh, build our forever home, you know. So, kind of like, all right, well, I'll kind of take a back seat then, you know. But me and Dad, we won the um, the first Elite 70 this year on Bugs Island. And uh, a buddy that stays with us, Greg, he was like, man, come down and fish the first uh, Bugs Island BFL, you know, the very next weekend. He was like, you stay with me at my house at Gaston. And I was like, well, you know, I'll jump into it, you know. And uh, I just kind of went and fished around the same area that me and Dad had success, you know, the previous uh, weekend. And I was able to scrap up enough to, uh, you know, have a ninth place finish. And then it just kind of rolled from there. Well, I guess I'm going to the next one now. You know, did go to that one. And well, I guess I'm going to the next one now. So, but as far as just things clicking, I mean, it's just really just been, um, sorry. Hang on. So. Adobe pop up. Um, as far as things click out, I mean, it's really just come down to just all the time on the water that I've spent with my dad all my life, you know, just learning from him, um, you know, just taking stuff in myself and then, you know, fishing a few years before I decided to jump into the front of the boat and enter a BFL, you know, learning what I could um, on the water by myself and just, it just happened to work out, you know, where I got on a good roll this year, so. But based on where you, where you live, would you consider yourself more of a lake fisherman, tidal fisherman? Like, where would you say that your roots are? Um, I, I would I would say Bugs Island is probably the place that I've been to the most over my life. Um, it's funny, you know, I'm I live 15 minutes away from the James River, but I can tell you the James River kicked my teeth up. <laughs> but for some reason, I get I like the Potomac River a lot. I've always liked the Potomac River. The Potomac River, ever since I was a kid, going up there with my dad, the Potomac River's always been probably my favorite place to fish in Virginia. I love fishing the grass. I love, I just love fishing up there. Even though it's tidal, I still kind of get along with the Potomac, but, you know, for some reason, the James River. I ain't figured out the James River yet. I had a good term this year, but I ain't really figured out the James River to, you know, and say what- that I'm good there. What's interesting about that is with all the people that I've interviewed on this show, example would be like Will Nash, who did the uh, the fall fishing report for Kerr. And, and the culture down there when you get to the North Carolinas is running and gunning. You know, if you're not burning $700 worth of fuel and hitting a thousand spots, you're probably not going to catch them. Whereas yeah. if you grew up on the Potomac, hell, you might power pull down, never fire up the big engine and catch 25 pounds. It's completely different yeah. cultural styles. You have seemed to buck the trend where you can do both. Is that kind of right? I'll be honest, uh, pretty much all year, um, all of my success has been boiled down to finding an area where I can get bites and riding it out. Really? I mean, um, I ran around some on bugs, but for the most, I ran around some on bugs, but all of my weight came in the same area that me and dad had, had success, you know, the week before winning the elite 70, um, whether near as much weight because we had just under 20 pounds for the elite 70 the weekend before, but you know, 12 and a half got me, you know, ninth place, you know, for the BFL. But, um, the only tournament that I ran around like a madman was of course, Smith mountain lake. It's a spawn tournament. So I ran all around the lake, but every other tournament, it just boiled down to find an area where I get a couple bites, you know, stay in put. Is so. would, that doesn't seem like the norm though for Kerr. Like, is that something that you've always done there to have success or was it just that moment in time as what you did? Really just that moment in time. Um, we had just, we had just found a stretch, um, a good pre-spawn stretch that had a lot of a good fish on it. Um, and I tried, you know, for the elite 70 and then I tried to kind of look at the map and the way it's set up and expand it. And cause I was trying to, you know, okay lightning ain't going to strike twice, you know, two weekends in a row kind of thing. But I tried to expand it and find other areas that looked similar and set up the same. And I just wasn't getting the bites. So 
so I was like, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to start over here. And, you know, I caught a few keepers and uh, ran around some and ended up coming back to it and caught another keeper. And then, um, you know, at the very end of the day, I came back to it. And, I mean, it was like, all right, last stop, 10 minutes. And then we got a roll and I ended up catching a four or something, you know, wow. which gave me 12 and a half pounds. So, I mean, but all of my fish came from that same stretch, no matter how I tried to duplicate it or find somewhere else that looked the same, just that, that stretch just happened to have them, you know, those two weekends. So, Dude, that's insane. And, and then really going from that to, um, you know, you had your May tournament on the Potomac, which you did ex- – which is funny that you know the the Potomac to come back up in this epic story during that event like what was your mindset since you already have and if you're fishing for points mind you 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 crack a top 10 your first one great everyone would be kind of happy with that you go to the Potomac now are you looking to try to swing for the fence or just stay healthy and points to have it like or did that ever like cross your mind through the whole series like maybe I should stop trying to swing for the fence here, play a little bit more conservatively, you know, protect my points. Like, did any of those thoughts go through your mind? Not really. I mean, I was, I was, uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's funny. Like I said, I wasn't planning on fishing BFL. So it just kind of this year because of everything I had going on, you know, in my personal life, but just did good at bugs. And then, you know, I took over the points lead at Smith mountain Lake. Um, you know, so at that point I was like, okay, well, let's, let's go to the Potomac. And then, um, I, I can't really say that I was focused on maintaining points. I was just trying to do the best that I could and where, the, where it fell, where it fell, you know, and, uh, I was able to find an area that had some good fish in it. And I stayed there the whole day. I fished the whole outgoing tide in this one bay and all day long. I didn't have a keeper until 1030, but I knew they were there and I knew once the tide got lower, it would get right. And I just, you know, trusted that, that I knew that and didn't get panicked, didn't run around. Mm-hmm. And then around, you know, 10 o'clock, 1030, I caught my first one. And then I actually had a phenomenal day from, you know, 1030 to the end of the day. Um, I didn't have any big ones. I had all twins. They were three to three and a half pounds and I caught uh, after I had what I had, I caught three or four more fish throughout the day that didn't help. I mean, they were by, by a couple ounces. So, I mean, I caught, I caught three to three and a half pounders all day long. I probably caught 10 of them. Dang. Wow. Um, but it, again, it was just finding an area that had, that had the fish in it and not running around all over the place. Um, I mean, that's just, that's the Potomac River 101. I mean, it's funny. Yeah. Like the more people I talk to, the more I realize the, the idea of when you read in Bassmaster, the Ike and Ellie milk run and how rarely that works. Like you, it can yeah. work, but it can also make you bomb. <laughs> like it's a, it's an all or nothing thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, yeah, I, guess I haven't fished a ton of tournaments on the James River, but um, just in all my fun fishing on the James River and the the tournaments that I have fished on, bringing it back to the, you know, the title scenario, the milk run, I have done a lot worse trying to run the tide, mm-hmm. you know, and I have just getting, you know, a couple, two or three areas where you can get bites and just riding those areas out and not getting struck out. If you're not getting the bites, just trust that they're going to turn on at some point. And um, that's, that's, you know, kind of what I did on the Pacific river. So, and the Potomac is so unique. Cause I know I've said this multiple times. You can basically win a tournament in every damn Creek. It's just, which right. Creek is on fire at that right. time that has your better right. fish. And that's a little bit more frustrating than maybe the James where there's a lot, I think a lot less key areas that people have won out of, uh, historically. Yeah. So when you went into that tournament, how did you, I mean, you already have experience on, on there, of course, but how did you narrow down that whole place to a manageable practice area? So I, I think I practiced two days for that event. So what I did was um, I kind of broke it up. You know, I broke the river up. I said, I'm going to go down south one day and I'm going to stay up one day, you know, the other day. And I'm just going to see, you know, which one ends up being better. And uh, I, I elected to stay down south in a quiet in the creek. Um, I just, that's, that's kind of where I had the most bites, saw the most potential. Um, obviously it was one out of Belmont, you know, but, um, just Potomac and Aquia Creek, 
they were a little bit more spawn related. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what I was looking for. Um, so I'd elected to stay down there. Yeah. Miles talked about that when I had him on the show, uh, last miles Pog cause he wanted, I mean, he didn't win. He came out of second place. I think he was in Potomac Creek if I, my memory serves me. So yeah. it's interesting so, how anglers always get grouped up. The ones that do well in this river. Yeah. Yeah. So you crack that there and, and then guys, yeah, we're going to be coming back to the Potomac here, but we got a couple more tournaments we have to go through here. You get back to your nemesis, the James. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, you have Kerr under your belt, you have Potomac under your belt, you have the Smith Tournament under belt. Are the, are you thinking about points yet? Yes. So I was thinking about points after Smith Mountain Lake because it, it didn't really hit me until after I finished 14th. You know, uh, it was kind of like right when we were packing up to leave after the event. I was like, oh crap, I got a ninth and a 14th place. I might have took over the points lead, you know, and I did. So that definitely, I mean, it sat in my mind a little bit, but I'm like, all right, let's go to the Potomac. And a lot of these tournaments lined up with our elite seventies too. So I was also like, all right, well, you know, let's run with it and see what happens with the points. If I bomb one, I'm probably not going to fish the rest of them just because like I said, we're building a house, you know, I can go to work, you know? Uh, so yeah, I mean, it was on my mind because I was like, well, if I do good and keep my points up, then I'll keep going to the next one. But it was also, you know, kind of lining up with our late 70s, using it as pre-practice, that kind of deal. But um, so I would say after Smith Mountain Lake, I thought about it a little bit. But then after I finished third at the Potomac River, you know, I start seeing my points lead grow a little bit. And I'm like, all right, well, uh, I am thinking about it pretty heavily now. And I'm like, I'm either going to stub my toe on the James or I'm going to survive, you know, to be able to go back to the Potomac. So I was definitely thinking about it pretty heavily um, on the James River. Um, but like you talked about with the milk run thing, I've been burned and me and dad have been burned so many times trying to run all over the place, run the tide. Um, we did horrible in the Elite 70 event uh, before that BFL. Oh, God. Doing the same thing, running around running too much um so i was like you know i'm not going to do that for the bfl um i am just trying to fish for points in the river you know because trying to do too much i could bomb um, and i just found an area i found an area in the lower chick um that i got a lot of bites um friday um in practice and i left out of there and i said all right tide works out where i can go sit in here on an outgoing tide all day and that's what i did and uh it was a grind, but it worked out. Was that an area that you found um, during the Elite Seventy, or is this a completely new area? No, I mean it's a, I mean it's, it's an area I've fished before, um, and I knew that you know it can be good that time of year. So that's kind of what I did in practice: was just bounce around a couple areas that I knew could be good that time of year. It should be good that time of year, and. Um, Ended up falling in a stretch where they were eating the frog really good on Friday. Shook every one of them off. Um, I mean, I got 10 or 12 bites on a frog and shook them all off. And I was like, all right, well, they're here. Um, and I got some bites in some other places, but it was nowhere near, you know, that. So I'm like, man, if I can come in here and I can get a decent limit, you know, that'll survive me in the points from this tournament. Um, but that was different than anything that you did in elite 70. So basically the okay. elite 70. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So basically yeah, yeah. the elite 70s tournament was, I mean, would you call it just a waste for you or was it actually important for you to decide what to do in the BFL? Was there lessons no, learned? No, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, they kind of flip flop like a, a elite 70 would be before a BFL or a BFL before elite 70. I am extremely happy that the elite 70 was before the BFL. Mm. Um, I, you know, I hate that we did terrible, but it really kind of changed my mindset going into the BFL um, on what I needed to do. Um, and that was, you know, I'm not running all over this river, burning two tanks of gas and weighing in six pounds and to lose what I have going on here because I know it's special. I know how hard it is to win Angler of the Year. Um, you know, we room with a lot of really good fishermen. I know looking at, you know, everything that they've done over their careers, it's just a hard thing to do. So I'm like, I don't want to ruin this, you know? So if I can find an area where I can get some bites and ride the tide out, 
that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I'm going to stick with. Cause I ain't running all over this river and, and bombing again. So I, I like that. you. I like that you brought that up because I feel like so many people, when you ask them, it's like with points involved, or if you're not trying to just go all or all or nothing, they really balk at that idea. Like, no, I always fish to win. I fish to win. But I do think there's merit to the idea that sometimes in a tournament, you're just trying to putt for par. You're not trying to swing for the fence and bomb. You just want to make it through. And there's a time when that strategy works. Uh, and it sounds like for you that, that I mean, honestly, what's, what's so cool about that is if you look at your finishes, um, you know, the James, like that's right there with everything else that you had. So it was a very good finish for just having the mindset of like, I just want to survive. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> The, the James River. I know every everybody can say this about a lot of tournaments, but I I I was I had the bikes to potentially win that tournament too. I was in the right area. Um, it 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 was definitely tougher than it was in practice. I didn't have my first fish until eleven o'clock on on the on the river, and I was I was starting to sweat a little bit. Well, here wow. we go. I didn't stub my toe. <laughs> you know, there it goes. Points down the drain, but I had a six pounder and hailed the frog at around eleven o'clock. And I was like, all right, all right, well at least I got six pounds. Let's see if I can get a few to go with it. I might be able to salvage it even if I don't come in with a limit, you know. And um yeah, I mean I grinded the rest of the day over there and ended up getting me five bites. I should have finished seventh. I had a my small one my small one that I caught at the end of the day, it ended up dying on me on the way back. Mm. Um, and I caught it an hour before weigh-in. I don't know what happened to it. I don't remember it being tongue-hooked or anything. I caught that one flipping. Um, I don't remember there anything, being anything wrong with the fish or anything, but yeah, that cost me seventh place. Wow. Um, but it was a grind. It really was. It wasn't anything like it was on Friday, but, um, but that was just sticking to my game plan, not freaking out, not – you know, getting stressed out and going, all right, well, I need to run here. I need to run here. I need to run here. I was live or die in that area. I know they're here. They'll turn on eventually, you know, kind of deal. So, And taking those lessons then, you have this Potomac tournament. It's a super tournament, which ended up being the same amount of days as the coast, believe it or not. Yeah. What is your experience in September on this place and how did you approach it with this much time in between? Um... I've been there quite a bit um, in that time frame. Um, I've, I've fished a few BFLs at the Co Angler up there um, in that time frame. Um, I made the cut, you know, the Super Tournament there um, on the Co Angler side. So I kind of knew what to expect. I knew it was going to fish tough. Um, I just, I, I, again, I, I did the same thing that I kind of did. Um, in the May, I think it was May, the May Potomac yeah. uh, tournament. And uh, so now I'm like really thinking about points. I'm like, I got an 81 point lead. You know, I think I need to come in like top 60, I think because it's points and a half or whatever. I'm like, I just need to catch a couple of fish. Mm -hmm. so my game plan going into that was I'm going to find somewhere where I can get some bites. It's going to be tough. If I can find somewhere where I can get a few bites, that's where I'm going. I'm going to catch my fish to lock up angular of the year. And whatever happens from there happens from there. Um, so, you know, I found two areas where I got bites, and that was, that was my game plan going into the tournament. But also on the flip side of that too is being that it's so tough. That's how you can win, also, and it happened. You know, if you can find a couple areas where you can get some bites, you need to you need to hang out there. Don't go running all over the place. It's hard enough to get bites. You know. So. Now, because you already had a tournament that you did extremely well on, uh, the Potomac earlier in May, do you check, let's just let's say it was Potomac Creek, do you check Potomac Creek, even though it's literally, you know, the other end of the year cycle going into the fall to winter, or do you write that off? Like, how do you not fish history? Or did you uh, want to fish history? No. So actually going back to, you know, you know, what tournaments were you going for the win? What tournaments were you going for points? At this point, I am points all the way. I need a couple fish. I'm not making a wrong, long run. I got a 20 year old boat, you know. Um, yeah. I, I haven't had any major issues with it, but I'm like, you know, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want that luck, you know, of trying to make a long. I didn't even go down there. I didn't want. Oh to. wow. 
I wanted to I wanted to try and find fish as close to take off as I possibly could to lock that thing every year. Mentally, so, how hard was that for you? Um, just I mean, to tell yourself, no, I've got it. This is my box, and I have to make it work here, even though you've had success down there. If I had to go down there, I was going to go down there. But I, I practiced. I practiced for two days. And I started, I'm like, you know, I'm checking Battle Woman, I'm checking Chicken Buxton, I'm checking Quantico, I'm checking Belmont. You know, I'm, if I can find something in that zone, yeah. then I'm, then I'll, I'd rather do that. If I don't find anything, yeah, sure. Second day of practice, I guess I'm going down there because I got to find somewhere I can get some bites. But luckily, I ended up finding some fish in Battle Woman, I found some fish in Chicken Buxton, and it worked out. Because so I didn't have to make that long run. And since I can peer through the veil here and I did all the mathies, so basically to win this thing, you needed to average, which you did, which was like 14 and a half pounds per day. It was what it ended up being. What was your mindset going in there about how much weight you thought you needed per day? <laughs> I'm t I'll be honest with you. I, was, I wasn't thinking about winning the tournament at all. At all. I just went in the – I mean, yes, everybody goes into every tournament. They want to win. That's, you know – why you show up, but I was points win angler of the year all the way. I was thinking about, I need a few bites. If whatever happens after that happens, but as long as I can get my few bites the first, the first day, the lockup angler of the year after that, I don't care what happens. So and let's rephrase it then. How much weight did you think you needed to lock up angler of the year? So doing, doing some research, um, like I said, I think I had like an 81 point lead going into the two day and that the event being points and a half, I figured I needed to come in the top 60. Well, you start looking at yeah. 60th place on the Potomac during two day event, super tournaments in September, you know, it's five pounds, six yeah. pounds. I think one year it was like four pounds. So I'm like, okay, I need to go catch two or three keepers. Mm. That, you know, all limit. You know, and if I can catch a small limit, that'll be a lot of weight off my back. And then, then we can start thinking about, okay, you know, let's try and make day two. Okay. Let's try and, you know, but, uh, you know, luckily I was able to pull into my first spot in Matter Woman and by lunchtime I had 12 pounds. Um, you know, I was able to go over to Chicken Bumps and make a call and get up to 12 and a half. I actually lost two fish that day that each fish probably would have gave me close to a half pound each. So I could have had 13 and a half, so 13, 13 and a half. Um, but so then at that point, I'm like, okay, looking at my research, 12, 12 and a half pounds might be enough to make the cut too. You know, and it ended up was, I was in ninth place after the, uh, after the first day. So I'm like, cool. Angler of the year is wrapped up. I made the second day as a bonus. What so, made you do that then? So you had 12 pounds of mad woman at that yeah. point. You probably, if you did just take a second to think of it in that moment, I probably have enough that I, I got angler of the year. Mm -hmm. Since it's a two day, did you ever think about, I'm going to start practicing or is it just pad the lead? Like, so that, that's did, did you of, leave to give that spot a rest is, I guess, is my, my point. Yeah. I, I, I kind of felt like that spot was, that spot was done because we were getting, um, Larry Freeman who won the co-angler side, uh, was actually my co-angler on day one. Oh, wow. Um, and he had 10 something. I had 12 something. And we were catching, you know, one or two fish every 30 to 45 minutes. Well, the last, I think, I don't know, maybe hour and a half that we were in there, we didn't get a bite. So I, I kind of felt it dying off. And like you said, I, I knew I had enough to uh, win Angler of the Year. And I'm starting to think, well, I, I think I got enough to maybe make the second day. I, I need to go check these other fish and kind of prepare myself for possibly fishing day two. Um, so yeah, that's why I ended up leaving out of there. Um, Cause I was starting to think about day two at that point. And, and then like, like you were leading on to with what you had uh, day one, 12, uh, let's see, we had 12 pounds. Yeah, you had 12 pounds day one or 1207, um, which, kept you right in the mix. Now you're thinking about day two. You had a great success in Mad Woman, but you did check some other stuff out. Yeah. It's so easy, I think, as anglers that we're just going to do what we did. We're not going to make a change, especially if we had a little bit of success. It's weird. Yeah. Was your was your plan of attack to basically wash, rinse, and repeat, or was it to make an adjustment first thing in the day? Um, 
so I, I, I didn't really change on day two. I did a little bit, but I had a reason why I kind of kept it the same. Um, I stayed in Mad Woman till like, till like 12 o'clock. And then at that point I was like, all right, this is kind of dying off. Um, I called a four pounder in there. Um, you know, that was my big one. I kind of felt it dying off and I'm like, all right, let's go check this other thing and chicken muffin. Um, so I stayed in there till like 12 and I was like, we're just going to go over there for the last three hours a day and see if I can kind of pinpoint where they're at, figure out what's going on so that I don't have to really do it on day two. Um, and I caught, you know, a cold fish in there, um, lost one in there. So, uh, so my game plan going into day two was I was looking at the tide and, um, you know, there was a lot of bait moving into these creeks and there was a lot of, uh, chasing going on and stuff like that. And Chickamuxin, the way it sets up, it gets, it gets pretty dirty on the incoming tide. And I didn't want to go in there on dirty water. So I'm like, all right, well. I'll just stay in here in Matter Woman until high tide, which ended up being, I think, around 10 o'clock. Um, so I was like, all right, I'll give Matter Woman till 10 o'clock. And then as soon as it gets high tide and it's about to turn, I'm going to spend the rest of the day over there. Um, so that's what I did. I did the same thing. I just didn't stay in Matter Woman as long. Um, I didn't get a single bite in Matter Woman. Um, I think my co angler caught one small one. Um, and so 10 o'clock. 10, 10 30, we rolled over to Chickamuxin and I sat in there and we caught them until we left. Well, then there. why did you, day two, you did pretty good day one and you're sucking at Madam Woman and it's seven yeah. o'clock and then it's eight and then it's nine. Yeah. When did the voices start coming in? It's like, why the hell am I still here? I might as well pull early and just get situated at Chick. Um, I don't know. I was really just trying to wait till the tide turned. I just didn't want to go in there with dirty water. I felt I felt I had a better chance of getting a couple bites mm. in Mata Woman with the water being a little bit cleaner than running over there in the dirty water. So I just hung out in Mata Woman until high tide, you know, until I felt like it was time to go over there and the bite was going to turn on over there. I mean, looking back, I probably would have just gone over there because but you don't know mm -hmm. so looking back i'm like well i didn't get a bite a single bite in that one and i might as well have been better off just going over to you know chicken bucket and sitting there all day long because that one didn't work out but at the time i was like i feel more comfortable you know getting a few more maybe getting a few more bites of fish that are in this grass bed over here they can't be the only ones we, we get the caught all the ones that were in there the day before and then going in there on dirty water yeah, there's just there's that also that that Potomac River strategy of okay if, if the juice is at 11 a.m. I want to be there about 10 minutes early, 20 minutes early yeah. to make sure I yeah. get my boat past everybody else and in the angle I want when the yeah. shit when when the juice comes and that's that's something I think like people don't really talk about strategy wise how important that is that yeah if, if the tide's good at at 11 you don't always want to show up at 11 because that could have been a little early by five minutes a little late by five minutes. And you got to battle the boat traffic because you never get a grass flat to yourself or very rarely. Yeah. Oh, there was boats all in there. And I, I was a little bit worried about that. And um, that's why, again, kind of looking back, I'm like, well, I guess I got, got lucky that I got to get in where I wanted to get in at. Um, but I, but again, like you said, with the bite window, um, I wanted, I didn't think that it was really going to turn on until that tide started moving out a little bit and pulling some of that dirty water out. Um, which ended up being the case. Um, so I went in there like a dead high tide, you know, right, right before. So I was in there, I was in there where I wanted to be at for probably 30 minutes before I got a bite, which was wow. when the tide started, you know, coming out. Um, so, but yeah, I, I probably should have went in there a little bit earlier because I knew exactly where I wanted to be. And being that there's Toyota series guys practicing, there's BFL guys, um, you know, but, but it uh, it, that's hard though. And that's why it's like, I think it's so interesting when you have multi-day tournaments, which I think is the purest form versus a one day where there's way more luck. I feel like, cause you can't make decisions to, to fix whatever you did or to right. improve on day two, you did well in Madam woman. And so I could totally see it's like, yeah, I'm going to stick in here as long as possible. But then it's like, you got something in check. When do you make that call? Cause I feel like I definitely have struggled with that in the past. A and when you're in the ch when you're in chick 
what were you doing something just completely different or you just were on the juice? Um, I, I guess I was doing something a little bit different. Um, you know, a, a lot of the people were staying out in the scattered grass. I was getting up in there a little bit farther. Um, there was a lot of eelgrass in there. There was a lot of sandy lanes, sandy holes, and eelgrass patches where it seemed like a lot of the rest of the bay was, unless you were out deeper in the scattered grass, it seemed like the rest of the bay was a lot of like thick carpeted grass. Um, so I kind of elected to stay on, on that side. But um, the funny thing was, is I, I found that... Um, that they would bite a fluke really well. And I didn't see anybody else throwing a fluke. <laughs> no one throws a fluke, man. No one throws I, a fluke. Was, I mean, it was, you know, they're wolf packing in there, you yeah. know, and it was like, it was like, I couldn't find anything that would get a bite unless they were like actively, you know, wolf packing um, the shad. And then I think the one thing I was, I was throwing a zoom uni toad um, in like a smoke color. Um, and that's what I was throwing on them. And I remember they got hung up around my eyelet. So I just picked up my fluke and threw it. And one came over and just crushed it. And I was like, okay, found something that they'll eat when they're not active. Yeah. <laughs> so I just kind of kept that in my hand the rest of the day. I didn't see anybody else doing that. Um, no, no one, no one does. Like but there, been... also, there wasn't a lot of people that were fishing up in like I was. There was people on the other side of the bay, but everybody that was out for me and on my side, they were kind of staying more out in that scattered grass, winding a bladed jig, throwing a Cinco around, a drop shot around and all that stuff. But now it's 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 such an underrated bait. I've been throwing that on the Potomac for years when the frog bite dies. And and from what um from Chris Johnson told me too, like a lot of those, the bait fish in there were like pilchards or just like, or Manhattan, I'm sorry, which is just because of that saltwater line being pushed up. Yeah. Is, that's what he saw in the Toyota series at least, which yeah, yeah that's, that's a, that's fluke imitation right there. One yeah. one um, especially yeah. they just get beat to shit with the frogs. I am shocked that they yeah. still bite a frog as good as they do when it's September. I, I'm, I, I threw the frog a decent amount. I, I love a frog bite. I threw the frog a decent amount in practice both days. I threw it around in Mad Woman the first day of the tournament. I didn't get a single blow up on the frog. I put I put it in my rod locker. I didn't even have it out. I, I threw it some in the morning the first day of the tournament on um, the Mad Woman. I put it up in my rod locker and didn't pull it back out. You know, I was, everything was on a bladed jig, and then and then I got on that fluke bite. How did you set up your fluke? Were you throwing that on a baitcaster setup or, you know, six pound test shooter? Oh, absolutely not. I don't, <laughs> I don't own four carbon less than 12 pound test. Good God. I, 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 dude, I, I, I throw that fluke on a seven foot three medium heavy with 30 pound braid Texas rig. And when they bite it, lock the rod up on it. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't like throwing light line. <laughs> I hate throwing light line. How do you survive on Kerr with 12 pound plus fluorocarbon? Good uh, Lord. If I'm, throwing, if I'm throwing 12 pound test, it's it's because I've got it tied to a 15 pound braid and I'm throwing a shaky head or I'm skipping a wacky rig under a dock. And a lot of times I might skip a wacky rig under a dock with a bait caster on 15 or 17 pound test. I just, I don't like throwing light line. I haven't, I haven't really seen it make a huge difference. But, it, you know, funny story of we you know, talking about the line is um, we've taken, we haven't been in a couple of years, but we would go up to um, Prescott Bay on Lake Erie Memorial Day weekend and catch smallmouth on it. And, you know, everybody's around throwing their spinning rod on a drop shot with a, and a shaky head and a Ned rig and all that stuff. And we're up there with seven foot three medium heavies, 20 pound tests and a, and a three eighths, a half ounce weight and a rage bug. And Good crack Lord. <laughs> I mean, I, we hate throwing light line. I hate it. Do you ever think I, that actually plays or is it just all a, a corporate conspiracy to make us buy hundred thousand dollar light fluorocarbon leader? I mean, I could, I can definitely see in like super clear water pressured fish where it can make a difference, but I don't fish a lot of that. 
I mean, yes, I go to Smith Mountain Lake, but I'll be honest, every time I've been to Smith Mountain Lake, I've been during the fall. Mm -hmm. I haven't been to Smith Mountain Lake in the fall or maybe the heat of the summer where you maybe need to downsize some more, you know. I mean, I don't even, I don't throw my 12 a lot. I don't even throw my 15 a lot. Pretty much every rod I got is strapped up with 17 to 25 pounds. (laughs) <laughs> you know it's, it's it's i actually i only own three spinning rods and sometimes i might not even bring any of them with me that is bold sir i don't know if i could do that at all <laughs> uh, i mean i grew up with fairy ones though so like i mean, I, mean and my, I feel like my, my two favorite ways to fish are flip and frog well okay that's a good thing there so because so, because christian won the toyota punching yeah. What's your experience with that? Did, did I even cross your head in practice? I just think it's so unique talking to him and, and some other guys. A lot of Potomac guys nowadays don't punch anymore, and that's because the grass wasn't good for so long. Is that something? Yeah, I love it. I love punching grass. I love flipping the holes in the mill full. I love, you know, flipping a dig and a lay down, short hand to hand combat, you know, right there, setting the hook. I, I love that fight. And we looked for it, um, but I, I ended up reading his article, you know, talking, and it was kind of the same thing that me and Dad found: is there was so much grass up there, it was so thick, it was hard to find mats that had canopies underneath of them. You know, you'd flip in a lot of the mats, and it would just be, I mean, thick from top to bottom. And he just, you know, he found found some mats that had a canopy in it, which I knew, you know, I mean, if you find that, you're going to get some bites. It was just hard. It was hard to find. Um, so, no, you know, punching didn't really, punching didn't play at all um, for the Super Turn for me just because really we just didn't find, find any mats that, you know, would work for it. Um, Do you know anybody else or your friends that found it? Because I just find that so curious where these Florida boys come up here and always do well in the Potomac, and it, and it I personally just feel like it has to that they get to punch more consistently and it's easier for them to find those those opportunities in tournaments when they present themselves. Yeah, I mean, they're going to come up here and they're going to do what um, they're used to doing, what they're comfortable doing. And if that means I'm going to spend all practice finding punchable mats, then that's what they're going to do. You know? Um, you know, me personally, just in the situation that I was in, I was like, I'm not wasting my whole practice looking for a frog bite and looking for a punching bite. If I can go over here and some scattered grass and throw a chatterbait and catch and catch bass, you know. Um, but no, I do love doing it. We just we just couldn't find any of it that was any really good. So you know, with, with all that said, you know, you cracked the win here. You had over 16 pounds. Um, just to tie this this tournament up into a little bow here. At what point? Because 16 pounds, dude. There had to have been a fish that you, made you think like, oh shit, did I just do a thing? Yeah, um, it was funny. Uh, you know, I caught my first, and uh, I was like, "Okay, well, at least I'm not going to zero today. That's cool." Because, because again, I didn't have a, I didn't have a fish when I went over there. You know, so it was, you know, I got over there at ten thirty. It was ten forty five, almost eleven o'clock before I put a fish in the boat. So, you know, I caught my first one, and I was like, "Okay, I'm not going to zero. It's a good one, two and a half pounds or something." And uh, then I caught my second one, and that one was. Um, I caught a couple of small ones. Um, and then, uh, you know, then I caught like a three and a half. Um, so that gave me four. And then I caught, um, and then I caught like a four and a half. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm working on a little bag here if I can get rid of these, you know, two smaller ones. And, uh, you know, and then I, I got rid of both of those. And I was like, I'm, I'm always really good. I like using the Cullen scales. I'm, pretty OCD. So I like using the mm-hmm. colon scales. I like weighing the fish as soon as I catch it, putting a tag on it so that when I have five and I catch my sixth one, I know immediately what it is. I feel like I'm not wasting it. I feel like I'm wasting more time catching five and then sitting down and taking the time to, you know, weigh them all and do all that. But well, this, this one, I, I will say I was a little bit irritated that I didn't have fish yet. So when I caught that first one. I just threw it in the box. And then they started firing up. So I'm throwing them in the box, throwing them in the box, throwing them in the box. So when I got my fifth one and I knew I had, you know, like two, three pounders and a four and a half, I was like, all right, well, I need to sit down and weigh these and mark them. So when I catch my sixth one, you know, I know which one to call. And uh, I look at my scale and I've got like 15 pounds. 
And I'm like, oh, uh, I might have a chance here. If I get, you know, I might have a chance. So um, I ended up calling two more times. Um, and then I'm like, I'm at 16 something. I'm like, I'm, so then, then I'm up front and I'm like doing math in my head, trying to figure out, okay, where was I at? Uh, what was the lead? Uh, who has to have what to catch me? And mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm like, man, I might really have a chance here. Um, and I called a couple more that didn't help me. Um, and then came in and just kind of listening to everybody around the dock. I was like, okay, it sounds like, uh, you know, a lot of people struggled. Um, it was funny cause, uh, Larry got it. He was, um, partnered with miles, um, the second day cause they were both in fourth place. And, uh, Larry got out of the boat and I was like, dang, Larry, looks like you caught him again. You know, you might have this in the bag. And he was like, yeah, my boaters got him good too. And I was like, oh man, he was a Ford and he's got him and I ain't got a chance. So I'm like, man, dang it. But, uh, you know, then come to find out he had, you know, 14 after I laid in 16 and just, yeah. So when I, when I sat down and weighed my five, when I caught a limit and saw that I had 15, that's kind of when it was like, oh crap. I, I, I can win this thing. So. Dude, that's a hell of a feeling. And I know it's just so many things coming into my mind too. When I think I have a good bag, it's especially in the Potomac more than anywhere else is like, should I get in early depending on what the weather is like? There's few yeah. places where I feel oh. like you have to factor that into your equation. Oh, yeah. We came in early. So <laughs> it was, it was like, um, maybe an hour and a half until weigh in and the wind started to blow like straight up straight up the river from the south oh, and i'm shit. and i'm like feeling the wind and i start looking back behind me and i'm seeing white caps on the river oh, and i'm like you know <laughs> i got 15 16 pounds you know i you know i got 16 pounds i i might need to leave a little bit early you know and uh so we did we came in early i think we came in like 30 minutes early um it was right nasty coming out of chickamauga even though it's just right out of the corner um yeah, and uh, just even taking an easy prop coming out of water a couple of times. I'm like, yeah, I'm glad we left a little bit early. So, <laughs> uh, so we went around and fished in Bad Woman, you know, 30 minutes trying to get my trolling or a couple more fish. Uh, but yeah, I definitely had to leave a little bit early. So, but dude, you got it in the bag 29 pounds over two days that got you. So, not only did you wrap up Angler of the Year, you know, you got your big, big, uh, big win here on the on the Potomac. And this is something I've always been interested about. Like, do they pay out for Angler of the Year wins? Like, do do you get a little extra? Yeah. So, um, at the regional um, on Norman, um, they give all the Angler of the Year trophies and checks out. So they pay a thousand dollars for Angler of the Year winner. That's stupid because I would definitely. I mean, I still think they got to adjust that shit out a little bit more because um, it's corrupt as hell. All, all these organizations, they should be paying you way more to win Angler of the Year because that's so much harder. It's so much I harder. Would, I would argue, and I've had conversations with other people that fish them too, that winning Angler of the Year is a lot harder than winning a one-day BFL. 100%. So I, I would like, I mean, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to see it, you know, equal out to a, the payment of a win, you know, or yeah. something. But, but I, think, I think they only pay a five grand to a Toyota Series Angler of the Year. Yeah, it's 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 a crime. I mean, again, I don't know where all the money's going. If anyone wants to come on the show that has insider information about all that stuff, I would love to have you on. Yeah, hey, it's all right. I'm happy with it. You know, the money always spends, but you know, the trophy, the trophy is uh, you know, is forever. I'm happy about so yeah, and it's really it is really cool too that my first win came on the Potomac because my dad has one BFL win and his was on the Potomac too. That's so, cool. Uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. Now, it's now, cool. if I'm not mistaken, did you fish the Toyota? Yes. So that, um, I did fish the Toyota series as a co-angler, um, on the Potomac. That was actually a, so that was 2014, was it? I think it was 2014. I graduated high school in 2015. Um, that was actually a birthday present from my dad. He, uh, my dad used to fish the Toyota series, um, when he owned his own business and, uh, we actually, I went, <laughs> I drove, well, I rode, I rode all the way up to Lake Champlain with him and uh, my grandfather. And I was on, that was 
going to be my birthday present was he was going to sign me up to fish as a co-angler and we were going to go up there for a vacation. And uh, we were, we fished all week long, practiced. It got down to the day before the tournament. I was first on the waiting list and I never got in the tournament. So I rode all the way home with my grandfather on my dad's stay up there and fish the tournament. So we, he ended up signing me up, you know, to do the Potomac river instead, um, since I didn't get into the, into the, uh, Champlain one. That's awesome. I mean, yeah. Zach, yeah. I can't thank you enough for coming on and really parting your knowledge and what it takes to actually put together one hell of a season. Uh, is there anyone that you would like to give a shout out to any sponsors? We can make sure we push. Um, you know, just, you know, my wife, for putting up with me <laughs> going fishing all the time uh we got a little four-year-old son and uh they love coming to the weigh-in so they enjoy it too but i work a lot so you know going away 12 weeks out of the weekends out of the year for four-day weekends is a little bit hard but um you know she supports me doing it so it's really cool and they try and make every way in that they can so it's it's easy to be supportive when you're when you're cashing checks though, so that does yeah, help a little bit. Yeah, so, uh, we'll we'll see uh, we'll see how it continues throughout the years because, like I said, it's my first year fishing. Being able to have the time to fish a full BFL in the elite seventies, so uh, we'll see if it continues over the years and see how she feels about it. <laughs> now they love coming out to them, so I mean, win, lose, or draw, you know, she's supportive and they just love coming out and watching us come in from the water and watching us weigh in whatever we got, whether it's five pounds or 20 pounds. So. Good stuff, sir. I mean, again, thank you so much for coming on a link in the episode description guys to, to Zach's social media. And of course, any of his sponsors that he wants to have linked up there as well, please like, and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out in the algorithm and we'll see you next time in fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Aaron's. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.